Sinead, I'll ask you first of all about the opening to Constellations. You begin with this incredibly arresting idea that the body is an afterthought. It is a mass of nerves, muscles, bones, about which ordinarily we pay no attention at all unless it's involved in pleasure or pain. And then you describe that moment when you were only 13 where your body was plunged into pain. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you and what it taught you about being a patient, about doctors, hospitals, and, and, and the meaning of that for you as a young child. Yeah, I mean, I think if you get sick when you're young, um, it's even more terrifying. An illness, as we know, is, is a terrifying interruption and disruption to your life. Um, and it happened to me, I was literally the first week of secondary school when everybody's forming their friendships and I was straight away into hospital for, they didn't know what was wrong straight away, so it was a lot of, you know, traction and biopsies and aspirations and all of these things until they eventually figured out what it was. But I ended up, I missed three months of school for four years in a row, so you miss out on a lot of stuff and you miss out on the friendships that were formed in those early days. And I talk a lot in the, the book about illness being like, a, you know, it's a, it's a lunar outpost, it's kind of a hinterland. You're, you're on the periphery of your own life when you're, when you're ill. And I found those years incredibly lonely um, and incredibly, because I had a, a hip problem and because I had a limp, I, the worst thing you want when you're a teenage girl is people to notice your body in lots yeah. of ways, and then you're hobbling around the place. Um, but it, 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 I talk about in the book going to, to, to Lourdes on, on a school trip where there was a, a raffle because everybody wanted to go to Lourdes. They wanted to go to Paris, but Lourdes was part of the trip. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, you know, as everybody was at a certain point in Ireland, very religious, I'm not anymore. Um, and I really thought I was going to get cured by going on this trip, and that kind of, that just things not working out in Lourdes, but also coming back to the hospital and the doctor. I did have initially a very good orthopedic surgeon, but I encountered a lot of people in that world. And it was a very male world. Thankfully, orthopedics has changed, but I didn't meet any women in that world when I was younger. Um, and there are a couple of scenes in that early section where, you know, I had a hip spike, a plaster cast, when it was taken off 10 weeks later, um, somebody literally cut into my body with a cast saw and sent my mother out of the room who was upset, dismissed and shouted over me. I had to go to theater the next day. I still have six scars on my leg because of that, that, that sore. So I learned very early on that sometimes people not only don't listen to you, but they dismiss you and don't, aren't, when you're saying that you hurt and you're in pain, you aren't always heard. Um, so I grew quite suspicious of, of doctors and mm. medical people. Um, and yet my experience later in my 20s with uh, leukemia was much was more converse. I have an amazing hematologist in St. James's mm. and all the people I met were, were wonderful and, and saved my life ultimately. Mm. But the two experiences, um, weirdly I think I was more able to advocate for myself because I'd spent all those years as a teenager in hospital. So I, I, I learned the language. You didn't know I have to speak. You know, if you don't speak up for yourself, nobody else is going to. Um, and my mother wasn't around when I, you know, she yes. wasn't there when I found out about the leukemia. So it, it, I, I ha I've had a wariness and a suspicion which has changed a lot over the years um, mm. because I've met a lot of good doctors too. Mm. And, and Arnold, I wondered whether for you there was a sense in which, like Sinead's body, your mind mm. was an afterthought. It was something to which you paid no attention. And if there came a point in your life when that ceased to be the case, you became aware of your mind as a problem, as an intrusion, and what that was like. I, I don't know, because I was always interested in, in writing and reading. <clears throat> so it's possible that I, I lived a lot in my mind anyway. Mm -hmm. And as um, a very introspective kind of person, and I wasn't very social as an adolescent, for example. Uh, so I, I think that the, I spent too much time in my mind, and I wasn't very good at sport, so that the body was something not to be particularly proud of, for example. Um, I was short. My first day at school, these um, bigger boys pulled me over, and they pulled me against the wall, and it's kind of a scuffle for a moment, and they pulled up another boy, and they said to the other boy, nah, you're still the shortest, so I was the second shortest in school. So, the, you know, <laughs> my, my body is something not to be particularly kind of proud of, so I, I was very much conscious of it. I spent a lot of time reading, reading, reading. I read, uh, I was taught to read by my sister when I was maybe, she said when I was three, I learned to read, and I just read avidly, and I would read in bed with a torch, that kind of thing, late at night, and I was a very heady person, and then I noticed that um, when I went to college, uh, there, was this kind of, some, there was an atmosphere in my home which was quite uncomfortable, and I didn't know what was going on, 
And I escaped to college, and again, I spent a lot of time walking around on my own, on my own, not talking to people and so on, and being quite introspective and so on. And then my mother died, and from then on, I began to experience depression, and then I was very conscious of the mind, without mm -hmm. at that stage labeling it. The labels came later, if you know what I mean, but mm -hmm. very conscious of there's something wrong with my feelings and what was going on, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And fast forwarding to the period that you depict in Mind on Fire, mm. Uh, again, an incredibly arresting opening to, to your book where we are plunged literally mid-sentence into mm. your mind at that time in the mm. full throes of mania, mm. something which I think unless you have experienced that state is extremely hard to imagine mm. and disturbing to read, let alone experience. Mm. How, how did you set out creatively to try and bring the reader into that world that they may have never experienced for themselves? Well, writing was a series of, writing the book was a series of stages and a series of immersions in, into it. So the, the first was a, a memory draft where I just really went into my mind, wrote down everything I could possibly remember of the, that period from the first diagnosis. The book is kind of structured around when it's first diagnosed in 1998, when it's 29 to 2008, my first play was debuted, which kind of marked the end of that period of the kind of lost decade where I kind of, again, had found myself. So um, to write about it, I, I would sit down and just force myself to get into my mind and picture the, the, the memories. And some of them are very, very vivid. And that opening passage, I, I mean, I could remember snatches of the dialogue, I could remember imagery. Um, what I've been writing for a lot of that time when I was trying to get better was screenplays and plays. And this is the first time I'm doing prose in quite a few years. But it's written quite cinematically, so it's mm -hmm. kind of like a camera's pointing at what was going on from the character's point of view, the protagonist's point of view, and um, I'm the protagonist, so I'm the protagonist and the character and, and the, the narrator as well, which is um, the base of memoir, I guess. And I just put myself right back in there, and I, I felt it again, and I could see it very vividly, I could hear it, and just try to put that down very precisely, sensuously into the words, you know? Mm -hmm. Would you be happy to read Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Um, So this is the, the opening passage of the book. Um, my editor, when, when it came to write the book, he's, he made this comment. He said he hates um, foreshadowing. So foreshadowing is when you kind of you know, preempt something that's going to happen later in the, in, in the narrative with a kind of little hint, and then people go, oh, what's that mean? And he said he hates foreshadowing, so I determined to put some foreshadowing into the book at that moment, <laughs> uh, just to kind of, uh, I don't know, I assumed he'd just cut it, because he's, he's, he's a very... Um, enthusiastic editor, but he actually left it in. <laughs> um, th th this takes place in winter 2004, which is really leading down into the, the um, rock bottom of, of my illness, which, as I said, had began six years earlier. And uh, it's a manic and paranoid episode. Uh, I'd left Dublin shortly before this, what I'm about to read, and I went to London. and. Um, I rapidly disintegrated um, in many, many ways, and I, I had no resource whatsoever. And although I did have relatives in England somewhere, and some friends somewhere in London, possibly, I, I, I just didn't have the wherewithal to really contact them and so on. Like I didn't, I don't know. I, I just didn't because I was paranoid. For example, you don't reach out to people, things like that. I also had no money, so I, I was going in and out of hostels. <clears throat> but the hostels were quite violent and quite scary, so I stopped going to hostels. And so I said I was homeless in London. And um, this part of the narrative picks up uh, around there. Uh, and it's in media res, if you like. <clears throat> you go on walking, walking through the city, thinking all the time of who you are and what you need and what you will do next, because you're actually a private detective following up on a complicated case one that only you can understand and solve, but no one knows that about you. They don't understand why you suddenly fall to the ground and roll there shouting, then run and hide yourself. And no one knows either that you are the star of a movie being made about your life, so they cannot comprehend why at one moment you laugh, the next you cry. And they don't understand that you are the survivor of a slaughter that has taken place, and the only witness to a genocide that is occurring outside the city which is why you stand in train stations and weep as the trains pull out on their way to the, to the concentration camps, taking the people in them to their deaths. 
And all these ideas are swirling around inside your head at once, hurling through your mind. It is on fire, so when you speak, it all comes out muddled and confused, and no one can understand you. So when you go into a pub and demand food and drink for nothing off the landlord, expecting to be granted it because you're entitled to it, you are an important person after all. He just refuses and tells you to leave. And you've annoyed him, so he follows you out, a big heavy man, follows you out onto the street, and though you smile at him before you turn to go, he lashes out and slaps you hard across the side of your head to send you on your way, removing that smile and driving you off with your ear ringing. And you stumble then on through the city, sometimes hopping on buses, sometimes on trains, and now you need to shit. You are unsure where you are, where you can shit, and you can, can't hold it on much longer. There's no way any premises will let you in to use their toilet. You're dirty and your clothes are torn. So you grab some newspaper out of the drain and go into a phone booth so as to be relatively unseen as you squat and expel an enormous turd and wipe yourself with the newspaper and go, leaving your stinking mess behind. <coughs> Pardon me. Go with nowhere to go still, through this city, this endless city, into shops where you are followed around by security guards and sometimes evade them so you are able to pocket things unobserved and sometimes observed so you are caught and so end up in a police van hurtling at speed through the streets of London to yet another police cell for the night before another appearance in court to be arraigned for a trial you will never turn up for. But these police who now ferry you in the back of their van have not searched your pockets, which was a mistake, because you have a box of matches, and so now you take them out and pull off your suede jacket that was given to you in a shelter, and you set fire to your jacket with the matches until the back of the police van fills with thick smoke, and the police have to break suddenly, stop in the middle of the street, get out of their van and come and open the doors at the back and get you out, pull you out into a plume of smoke, wrench you out, see you laughing, dismiss you as a waste of time and effort, and go and attend to the fire in their van, and so off you go. You continue to walk through the city to a train station and onto a train. You don't even know the destination and get out and are lost. And you do feel, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and yet you feel all is well. There is nothing wrong, and your mind is racing, full of rushing thoughts, each more beautiful and fascinating than the last, and you have nowhere to go today or tomorrow, and still the energy surges through you, so you get back on a train that brings you back to the city, and you just decide you will keep on walking, endless walking, and even though you have nowhere to go and nothing to do, you feel that there is something pressing that must be attended to, and that must be attended to now, immediately, which gives a sense of urgency to everything you do, so you don't stop, and the thoughts don't stop, and so you are alone so far from home and friends and family, and you don't think of any of that, of them. You have too many other things to think about. You're full of energy and plans and things to do to get done. And it all makes sense to you. You actually feel so happy, despite being hungry and alone and cold. Yes, euphorically happy as you walk on, walk on through the city, full of rushing thoughts, and your mind is burning, burning, burning. And I should say here what I said about Sinead's book. If you haven't read Mind on Fire, I would make it compulsory reading for every medical student in every medical school in this country, Britain, everywhere, and I think for doctors too. It's incredible, in incredibly effective at helping us empathize mm -hmm. with our patients and their states of mind, which is very difficult to, to understand. Mm. Um, Sinead, a, a, a point in your book that I was deeply moved by was that moment when you were given your diagnosis of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Initially, your doctors thought you had a DVT, a blood clot, uh, but it was something more sinister. And I would love it if you would read that passage That's and then right. perhaps we can discuss it. Um. This is a, there's a, a, the longest I say in the book is about blood and it's divided into uh, the A positive, A negative uh, and all the rest. Um, and this is about that, that diagnosis. Um, and one thing that happened the night that I was told it had been a long day, the DVT, uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, which I thought was bad enough, um, but I th hearing the leukemia news and my godmother who I write about in the, in the book and her dementia, she was with me at, at the time when I was told and my parents were coming back later and because I was terrified to tell my mother because I thought she was going to absolutely fall apart, I had to think of something to say when I asked the nurse to tell my parents. I, I couldn't do it myself. And I thought, when she comes around the curtain, I'm going to have to say something to her. And I don't remember saying this, and she only told me this when I was writing this book. 
apparently I said, I'm not going to die, I'm going to write a book. Um, because I had to offer her something, so yeah, it took me years, but it finally did it. Um, so I'll read a bit from that, that night. If you take all the blood vessels in an adult body, veins, arteries, capillaries, and lay them out in a continuous line, they're said to measure 60,000 miles. Typing these words, fingers depressing keys, there is a movement of tendons across a pale landscape of skin. But what I notice most is the blue of the veins, every slim stream, each a messenger of the blood working away unacknowledged. Over the years, several cannulas have been attached to my arms, pre-surgery or when the veins of the elbow collapsed like a coal tunnel. Each time, a phlebotomist offers words as preparation, but they are never the right words, always inaccurate about the sensation that follows. You'll feel a scratch or a nick, they say. It feels like neither. In my late 20s, six months to the day I married my husband, I found myself in an ambulance on a cold, glass-clear January morning, a paramedic holding me upright because it was too painful to sit or lie on the stretcher. Later, in the hum and chaos of the hospital, I was told that something of concern lurked in my blood. I hadn't suspected there was anything wrong until I found I could not bear any weight on my right leg. The throb and sear of it continued and a doctor dispatched me to casualty, where I waited on a trolley in a tiny room beside two pensioners. That I was stationary for 72 hours now seems terrifying, given that the eventual diagnosis was deep vein thrombosis. A doctor speculated that it was caused by the contraceptive pill, so anticoagulants were administered in elephantine doses. Weekly visits to a warfarin clinic followed and an airless room where I sat among old women, a sea of silver heat-treated hair, the youngest person by decades. Warfarin, a mass market blood thinner, comes in at three O strengths and colors, pink the strongest, followed by blue, then brown. A handful of pinks is a good indicator of having treacle thick blood. No matter what colors I took, in rainbow combinations, my coagulation level bounced around like a skimmed stone on water. A persistent cough percolated in my lungs, and one day I woke to find my legs dotted with black bruises. Not just a handful, but more than 20 mottled circles. They weren't trauma-inflicted, so they didn't hurt, and I know now that this phenomenon has a name, ecumosis. From New Latin and Greek, ecumosis, to pour out. The cause of the bruises was blood leaking from a blood vessel under the skin. The colour frightened me. It wasn't recognisable as anything from the usual bruise spectrum, Night sky, purple, pond green, everything felt ominous. Night sweats woke me constantly and it felt like there was worse to come. What was happening to me? With illness, there's always a sense of before and after. The before time when everything is bright and even keel and normal, a word that loses all meaning in the face of disease. The final moments of before, just as it slowly dawned that bad news was coming, was when a hematology registrar, kind, blonde, about my age, used the word blast. Her reference was not to having fun or Star Wars gunshots or a wind gust that cuts you in half, but to myeloblasts, immature white blood cells that spill out from the bone marrow. This was a new word, and used in a medical context was enough to ping the synapses to make me ready myself. I fished for answers, dropping a line into this new terrifying water. The hematologist was circumspect, eventually admitting there was an irregularity in the bone marrow. Like leukemia, I asked. In that moment, I did not know where the question came from or how I made such a leap from bone marrow to cancer, but what did I know in this land of before? To be an undiagnosed patient is to be in a constant state of fear, of waiting for the revelation. Offering a hazarded guess is an attempt to compute or accelerate the truth. On that Sunday, it felt like weighing up the facts of my body. The black bruises and night sweats and chest heaving cough were coming from somewhere. So both of you, you're, you're given these diagnoses, powerful diagnoses that are so much more than the diseases, they're redefinitions of yourselves, these labels. And I wonder how you reacted to being handed these labels. So um, bipolar disorder, like many. Can I jump in there? Yes. Because I, I wasn't given a diagnosis, you know mm, what I mean? Uh -huh. that, like, it's interesting because you were yeah. in this clinical setting and so on. I was, like my first hospitalization, I was, I was manic and I was 
um, medicated in a very well, confusing to me way, very distressing way. Mm -hmm. I was given things and, and I was forcibly given things and I didn't know what I was being given. And then I was discharged several weeks later and there was never a consultation where someone sat down and said, this is what you have. And I only figured out by seeing letters to my uh, doctors back in Dublin. I was in Northern Ireland, you see, and it's a very confusing diagnostic history, if you know what I mean. And there's never a conversation. I figured out by myself, oh, they're talking about bipolar disorder, or, you know, I, I kind of put things together. And I, I, it, it's possible that I was in a confused state, mm -hmm. which added the confusion, but no one was really saying this is what we're treating you for and what you have. And then I went back into hospitals, there were several hospitalizations quite rapidly, and I said quite clearly to my doctor one day, do I have bipolar disorder? And said, I think you may be got irritable depression. So again, it's very confusing. And then I went through a long period where I denied my, uh, I was very ashamed of this diagnosis, and it was very, I felt very stigmatized by it, and I denied it to myself and denied it to others. And so I thought, for example, that I was um, hypoglycemic and lots of other things, and I saw this psychiatrist who said, no, you're not bipolar, your mania was caused by taking antidepressants. So that, mm -hmm. I grasped onto that narrative for a long while, if you like. That's, we're talking about stories, you know, I really believed that. And it wasn't until after that passage I read where I went, hit rock bottom, and I was in England, I went to an NHS hospital, and they really did sit me down and say, look, we can help you, this is what you got. Stay with us, let us treat you. So that's, that was six years later after the first mm -hmm. episode. Did yeah, so when he said, I, I never, so it took a long time for me to get to that point of, oh, now I've got to accept my diagnosis. And even then, I was still kind of hedging it, going, no, maybe I don't, you know, I don't want to hear mm. that. Mm. And the shame and mm. stigma, yeah. did, did that apply to you, Sinead, with a cancer diagnosis? I, it, I mean, it's just, I'm sure there's probably lots of people in this room who've had cancer diagnoses. Um, uh, it, it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, it is kind of movie stuff. It's the worst thing you're going to hear. And yeah. what, you, what you have is you have a flash forward of the life that you think you're going to have. And at that point, uh, the one thing I remember thinking, because I, I just got married and I had always wanted to have children. And at that point, there, there is egg freezing in Ireland now and there's various things you can do. But they, they just said to me, you were so unbelievably ill. Your chemo starts in the morning. There's, there's no option of that. Um, so lots of things you think are going to happen for you in your life, it's immediately, you have a different horizon. And it's really, really frightening. And I think the first night, I think, was the night I was most afraid. And I had to call my brother who lived in Australia. And that was very hard. But after that, I was like, the only way to meet this is to meet it head on and to be, if you fall on about getting better and to not think about it, I'll, I'll be allowed, I, I'll allowed to be upset for one night. Um, but it's really, yeah, it's, so, it's really, it's really difficult. And I, I, again, it just, I, I say this all the time, illness takes you away from your own life. That's, that's why I find illness incredibly boring. Um, it stops you from doing all the things you want, you know, hanging out with your friends, traveling the world, being with your children, being at home. It just, it, it is a massive, um, you know, it just it juggernaut that goes into your life and stops you being able to do all the things. And that's what I find about it the most thing. It, it stops you from doing the things that you want to do and all the things. And that's what, it, that's what a diagnosis like that was. All I saw was, this is this it for me. And I thought, I, I don't want to die, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. to, to Can I to, just respond yeah. to that? Sorry, excuse me interrupting you, but that, that flash forward moment is, is, I had that as well when I was in the hospital in England and I accepted my diagnosis. And now, you know, 15 years later, I recognize that that acceptance was the first step of getting well. But my initial reaction to accepting the diagnosis was that flash forward of, I'll, I'll never have a, a, real, a normal life, I'll never work again, I'll always be dependent on social welfare payments and, and others to help me, I'll always be in and out of hospital, because I've seen so many people in and out of hospitals, like, because well, I had long stays, and some would be di uh, discharged, they'd be back again a few weeks later, that's my life. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I'd be back in the streets, living homeless again. I thought I'd never have a relationship or anything like that. So I had the exact same, and that, mm -hmm. that really profoundly affected me for two or three years. That, and that was a kind of form of depression in itself, mm -hmm. just from the acceptance, but it, it was necessary as well. So you're, Sorry, you're yeah. railing against the diagnosis, that label of bipolar disorder. Yeah. Was that almost a form of self-preservation because that prospect was so unbearable? Well, I, I, I knew then, like I, I began to chip away at thinking I, I did want to get back to things. Like I did want to get back to things and something kept me going. I, I guess that's the mysterious thing of how, where does wellness come from? You know, once I had accepted it, I did try, I mean, I, I continued to take the medications even though I thought I'd never have a good, I would never have a good life. But I was taking the medications anyway. I was going to activities through this um, outpatient cl clinic. I think I'd never gone to have a real life or anything, but I'll, I'll just get along anyway because maybe there's some prospect of, 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 of happiness eventually, you know, mm -hmm. maybe. But mm -hmm. I didn't believe it for many years. Mm -hmm. 
how much do you think the words we use to describe illness are part of the problem? How much do they make illness more frightening, more distressing, more stigmatizing for patients? And I, I, by we, I don't mean doctors specifically necessarily, but, but society at large. I think, I, I mean, I, I mentioned at, at .md before that I, I, I'm quite nerdy about medical language. I'm really interested in it. I think it has its own musicality. I, I, I own a medical dictionary and just have an odd browse every so often. <laughs> um, um, and I love the language, but I, but I also think it does feel like you're, 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 you're learning a, a foreign language. You're, you're learning something different when you're outside of it. So I learned very quickly that you have to learn to talk to doctors about your own experience and you have to learn the language so that you're, and I, I, it said to me a couple of times, are, are you, you're a doctor and you're like, no, I, it, I'm not, but I'm interested in my own medical narrative and therefore I've had to learn this language to, in order to inculcate and communicate it mm -hmm. in the best version that I can. And often because doctors are really busy, you don't have a lot of time to talk to them, so you've got to talk quickly and speak their language. Um, but it is, yeah, it can be very alienating. But things have changed. I mean, there's more conversations that, that I think are inviting patients in to be part of their own story. And that's what the, that's the biggest part of it, is that, that being heard, being listened to, um, being empathised with, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, a few things come to mind. One is that, I mean, I've obviously embraced the word <coughs> madness. My, my book is subtitled A Memoir of Madness and Recovery, and I, I mean, it's kind of like mad pride. I, I mean, it's something I, I, I acknowledge that I was <laughs> mad. I mean, I was completely off my rocker. Like, I was, it was crazy, 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 crazy. But that was, that, and it, it was horrible, you know, it was horrible. But I, 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 there's no point trying to gloss over that, you know. Um, but also, I mean, I was... Like Sinead, I was quite fascinated by reading about the theory and the, the origins of bipolar disorder. So I've read a lot of books around it, so I know the kind of the clinical language, so I can kind of talk if I'm in a clinical setting, if you like, about that. But I've also been in psychoanalysis. Uh, my last psychoanalysis took over five, like it's over a five-year period, and I still occasionally visit that person. So um, that's a more creative way of talking. I mean, that person would mm -hmm. not talk about clinical diagnosis, that psychoanalyst, you know, he would not say, bipolar, this, that, whatever. He'd be much more traumatic experiences and feelings and so on and so forth. And so different words. So, and as a writer, I'm very interested in the words used to describe myself. But, um, and also, I mean, articulating it in words, um, the origins of the book was that I started, was asked to teach a creative writing class in life writing to a group of psychiatric service users. And I already think of that word, psychiatric service users. And when the first thing I did when I got into the room with those people, I said, we're all writers here. I mean, it means you're changing the words and how you approach people. Yes. But the pur purpose of that scheme is called Discovering Me. It was a pilot scheme. Uh, it was to help the people in the room tell their own stories to doctors. So obviously, it was recognized that, that was an issue, that people weren't talking. And what was happening is that they were bouncing back to the doctors the diagnosis that they'd been told, but not hearing their own individual stories. So it's thought that maybe through creative writing, they get to write their own life stories and then have a more articulate way of explaining themselves. And that's the purpose of my, that class. <clears throat> and that got me into life writing in that fact. Of fact. Obviously, then I've been a playwright. Interesting. You know. So yeah. I think a lot about words, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sinead, you depict very graphically the sense of disorientation and alienation and, and, and loss of power yeah. that you experience upon entering a hospital as a patient. And... Uh, the sense in which almost every aspect of a hospital, from the architecture to the white coats to the gown that exposes your bare bottom to the rest of the hospital, all of that combines mm. to uh, exacerbate your powerlessness. C can you expand upon that a little bit and perhaps r read? Yeah, th there's a section. I, I mean, I've, I've Hospitals are really interesting to me as, as spaces and architecture in that they're really, I'm always looking for the exits, even when I go and visit somebody. Um, <laughs> I, but I, I find them, they, they're maze-like and they're confusing and they're so large and they're, they're kind of like an installation. They're like a gallery in, 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 in a way. So I, I wrote about that um, in, in a kind of fragmented piece called Panopticon. I don't know if you know what a Panopticon is. Um, it was uh, it's an architectural space where, and it was used a lot in the design of prisons where everybody can be seen by, by one guard at all times and don't always know that they're being watched. And I, I talk about um, Michel Foucault, the birth of the clinic in the book, because he writes about it a lot. So I find them really interesting, strange spaces. But, and also when you're in hospital, which is why this is kind of fragmented, you're constantly interrupted, there's no quietness, you're aware of sounds and smells that's completely alien to your own home life. So 
this, your strength, it's, it's almost like the stream of consciousness the way you think in hospital because everything is so interrupted and broken and there isn't a lot of relaxation. They're not very restful places, as we, as we all know. Um, so I kind of wrote about, it's in sections, so if it sounds like I'm, I'm hopping around a bit, um, it's just to give you a sense of various thoughts that went through my head in this panopticon. It's called Panopticon Hospital Visions. There's a chance that you enter the world in a hospital, first cries ringing out beneath stark lights, emerging under the blue sea of your mother's surgical gown, at once subjected to the medical gaze, weighed and watched, doctors listening for a sign that says, I am here, I live, I breathe, the snail shells of bunched fists jabbing at air. The air conditioning goes unnoticed for me, by me for weeks, until it appears like tinnitus and the rattle becomes an anti-earworm. Nurses and cleaners tell me they can't hear it, but it thunders through every night, the telltale heart beneath the floorboards, the woman inside the yellow wallpaper. Do you hear that? The haematologist addresses the student doctors ringed around my bed, a white-coated picket fence. A clot sounds like a creaky door, he says. When they leave, I listen for its hinges. New day, new cubicle. The woman in the next bed speaks conspiratorially into her phone. My urine was clean, I told you. <laughs> a curtain is not a door. Confrontation, confidential consultations hang in the air, a murmuration of medical words, a swallow swoop of numbers and percentages. Someone on the other side speaks Russian, doctor or patient. Spasibo, they whisper. Thank you. Hail the body's own geography, what Foucault called the anatomical atlas. Latitude tendons, longitude veins, the textured terrain, the soft rind of skin, rope hair, sandpaper stubble. This may not be a war, but there are two sides, the well and the unwell, doctors and patients, staff and visitors. Susan Sontag wrote of the jewel kingdoms of the well and the sick, one passport stamped, the other with the corners cut off. Illness gives us permission to drop everything jobs, commitments, the tangle of repetition that is everyday life, but the price is high. Hospital requires a packed bag, but no ticket. Instead of yellow islands and turquoise shallows, there are rectangles of blankets, beds instead of sun loungers. There are a hundred ways to break a leg. No two breast cancer diagnoses will have the same typography. My cancer is not your cancer. My fractures are not yours. Illness, despite its classification and language, is as unique to each patient as their fingerprints. It is not generic. It resists homogeneity. It is, solely about it is not solely about biology, but intersects with gender, politics, race, economics, class. Infarction, presentation, pyrexic. I have learned their language, picked at the bones of their syntax. Marsupialization. The most important part of such an interaction is not to listen, but to ask. GA or spinal. But I have made frequent inquiries about my health because I have made frequent inquiries about my health using the medical worlds that belong to my history, it has been assumed by doctors that I am one of them. This has an implication of its own, that a patient's motivation for being invested in his or her own health is transgressive. To be curious or to possess such knowledge is not your place. My assimilation of medical language, of inverting the act of questioning, has always been an attempt to assert autonomy, to hold on to a small part of my medical story. The, the, the power dynamics that you allude to there, Arnold, how much have they been a feature of your experiences with healthcare? Well, I did write down what you said, not, not knowing your place, because it just reminds me that there was this... Um, as I, I got to learn more about uh, my illness and recognize triggers and so on, that I, I was going to psychiatrists and saying, you know, please help me before it happens again. I need something mm -hmm. now. I do remember specifically, it's, it's, it's a diary extract in the, in the book, and, and it's the uh, ask your doctor, that I, I can't sleep. You know, it's been weeks and weeks I can't sleep properly, and that is a trigger for mania. And the doctor like, refusing the, the sleeping tablet uh, uh, prescription. And when I was 
getting more agitated. He's saying, you know, I said, I'll end up in hospital. Is that what you want? And he said, don't threaten me, you know. And it's just obviously a complete breakdown of communication. And I, I, I don't know that there's a room full of doctors. I'm sure they've been with agitated patients. And what do you do? And his, his point was that he didn't want a patient becoming addicted to sleeping tablets, but I needed intervention, medical intervention, I thought then. as coming more articulate, you know. But also what you're talking about, words, the, the previous question, I was thinking that um, when one is manic, there's words become important because you have this pressure of speech, and then you get this, you know, if you're starting to speak fast, as I'm now speaking a bit fast, you're kind of like, oh my God, am I getting manic? Or people perceive me as manic. But then when you're depressed, you're completely mute, and the most you can say is, I don't know. And I'm sure, again, the psychiatrists in the room, they say, how are you feeling? And what's the, the effect today? I don't know, I don't know, and it's over and over again, that kind of like, I don't know, and I've been through that as well. So this again about words, like the, the, the contrast, and also when you're manic, you just don't make sense. Like you're, just, mm. you're so alone because you're speaking this language that no one else can understand, and it's it's so isolating, you know. Mm. Mm. And words, of course, if used in the right way, can be therapeutic, mm. um, and also perhaps a form of self-therapy. And did you find the experience of giving voice to that lost decade in this memoir was a therapeutic exercise for you? Well, I'd be very careful of using that word therapeutic mm. and um, because, uh, as I mentioned, I was in psychoanalysis. And as in that period I was writing the book, I was in psychoanalysis as well. So <clears throat> I was very able to um, filter out what I was doing with the book, which was an artistic endeavor, which what I was doing in psychoanalysis, which was helping me mm -hmm. therapeutically. But having said that, the book was cathartic, which is a different type of thing. It was a cathartic experience to, ha to have written it, but I didn't go into it at all as, as therapy. Now, I, I do believe in the therapeutic benefits of life writing and, and creative writing in general, but that's a whole uh, separate thing from what I was doing, which is trying to tell my story in an artistic mm -hmm. way, I believe, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm the opposite. I, I don't believe in catharsis, and I, I, mm. writing this book didn't make me feel better about those things. Um, and strangely, writing the most medical parts of the book were were difficult, but it was other more part. There's an essay about somebody. There's a couple of pieces about grief in the book, and I found mm -hmm. that one of them in particular took me over ten years because, obviously, when you're writing about other people, you want to get things right, and you don't want to hurt people. Um, and I, you know, there's the line: every writer needs a sliver of ice in the heart, but. I, I don't want to, I, I still wouldn't like to, to, to cause someone pain by something that I'd written if I thought it was trying to make me feel better. But parts of it were, I, I always say essays are kind of, they're, they're trying to answer a question. So I figured out how I felt about a lot of the stuff, but I don't know that I could say that it necessarily made me feel better by, by writing it. But it, I, it answered a lot of questions, and that's what writing can do. I think mm -hmm. it can answer questions. Mm -hmm. What I, happened to me, Sinead, is mm -hmm. that I, as I was writing, for example, about depression, I could feel again, I didn't feel depressed, but I could mm. feel the sensations in my body. Yeah. And it's very challenging. I, I got out of the house, went to a cafe, a local cafe, which is bright and, and well lit and so on, and wrote those sections there. I was also looking at my medical records and seeing written about myself, how other people perceived me when manic, when mad. And that was very disturbing indeed. Again, I went out to the local library to do that, then went back home. There's kind of these degrees of separation, if you know what I mean. And then finally, when the book arrived, you know, the, the, pr the proof and then the actual public version, is like this weight had lifted, which I didn't know I'd been bearing on, in me, in my body, for all those years, had lifted and was it, contained within the, the weight there of the book. And it's strange now, I had been brooding over the events of the, the story of my life, that decade, for so long. When they're happening, everything that led up to them, and obviously when you're depressed, you're just brooding, brooding, brooding all the time. I, I don't think about them anymore. Yeah. It is, it's, I'm a different, I, I'm a changed person, you know. I also think it's, it's odd, I, I, it, in my 20s, I must have been suffering from low-level depression all the time, and one of the most uh, horrible uh, symptoms of depression is irritability, and I, I was a real asshole in my 20s. Like, I was just so irritable and bad-tempered to other people. I was very obnoxious and unpleasant to be around, and I like to think I'm more pleasant now, but um, <laughs> I'm definitely less irritable, to, to, just to put a, a word in it. Like, I'm, I, am, I am not perfect by any means. I get Irritable, yeah. but um, <laughs> uh, I, was, I, was, I, was a, I was a monster in my 20s, yeah. and I, I think going through like so much, uh, the writing the book, but also the, the breakdowns and so on, that something got, got loosened and so on like that. I, I think as well, one of the, the things that happens when you write a book, and I don't know if Arnold's had this, is that, and there's been a lot of conversations this morning, Colm's beautiful speech about, talking about storytelling and healing, is that when you write a book and it goes out into the world, you don't have any control over it, and there's nothing you can do or say about it, and then the stories find other people, and I've had so many 
heartbreaking and fascinating and funny conversations with people, you know, people who've had terminal illness, people who've been sick, people who've been bereaved. People, it almost gives people permission to tell their own stories. And even though none of them want to be writers, they need to hear what you have to say sometimes. And that's been the most humbling, I think the best part of publishing a book. Yes, yes. I've, I've loved it. I get emails, I had an email on Sunday from someone and they said that they had a diagnosis a few months ago, bipolar, and they're like, they got to the end of my book and it's like this fear of it'll come back. And, and yet my book gave him some hope. And it's yeah. as simple as that. I go, yeah. okay, that's not the intention. I just wrote no. it as a story of truth, of what my truth is, but it, it is happening and it's very humbling yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you, you must find that incredibly moving, the idea that what you have created is out there possibly helping the lives of other people with yeah, your diagnosis. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. It's absolutely very moving. Yeah. I yeah. hear from lots of doctors as well, which is, which is wonderful because they're mm. the people that you want to hear some of these stories. I mean, the book is for all kinds of people, but it's wonderful when I hear from medical people about it, it helps. It, it's, a, it, it's a shortcut into patient perspective, I think, and they, yeah. they hear things that are hopefully useful to them. And a question about doctors. Mm. So That sounds really <laughs> ominous. <laughs> reading both these books, for me as a doctor, both are wonderful ways of um, helping me to try and empathise with experiences I cannot truly understand. I have not been diagnosed with cancer or bipolar disorder. Um, and therefore, I would prescribe these books for <laughs> doctors and many others like them. Um, we heard this morning about the idea of doctors prescribing poetry for patients. What about patients prescribing a good dose of <laughs> life writing or creative writing for doctors? Do you think that would be beneficial for our practice? Absolutely, and I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of medical humanities, and I know there's a, a, a wonderful man, Paul O'Connor, who teaches Trinity uh, medical students and has, has uh, used a couple of essays in the book, and other people, Tyranny Grief is poetry as well. Um, and I think that... I mean, art is meant to, te there's the Joan Didion line, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I think that even if it's not nonfiction, even if it is novels or poetry or short stories, that it's a, it's a route into somebody else's life. It's an experience that might be opposite or anterior to yours, but there's something we can learn from that. And I think with, with nonfiction, and particularly these kinds of books, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a route into show, walking you around somebody else's life. And this, I mean, it, we go to the, we go to the film, movies to, for escapism, and these kinds of books are a way of being in, immersed in, a, in often quite terrible and tough stories, but maybe f focusing and applying it to your, to your own life. So I think, yeah, uh, uh, I would love to happily... This, I've got whole lists of books I could recommend. If anybody wants me to, uh, I'll do it. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I, I'll take you up on that. Well, I, I just think, I mean... I mean I teach creative writing and I teach life writing, as Sinead does, and I, I just think it's, it's really hugely beneficial. I was talking to uh, one of my former professors just yesterday, uh, Darren McCann from DCU, formerly from uh, the James Heaney Center. Uh, he was saying that he, he has this wonderful moment where he's teaching life writing where he has this, sees the, the revelation in his students when they have a valid story to tell. I think that's mm. a very beautiful way of putting it, and it's something that I, I have come across as well when people kind of it, it clicks. It's like, I do have a story, and that's what, what happened to me writing, you know, when I did started to pick up life writing for the first time mm -hmm. when I was teaching the students and started to do these exercises with them. I thought, I have something I really want to tell about myself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I think absolutely doctors should be doing it as well. Um, and there was a, a thought of this pilot program that I did could expand that we could train doctors to do it with, with not just writers, but also doctors to do it with, with other uh, patients, service users, you know, people in the service kind of thing. Um, but that never happened because it just didn't get the funding, of course. I wasn't funded properly. Uh, it was a little bit more funding. But I'd love to see more of that going on. And um, at the moment, I'm working in the area of uh, health and well-being and with this organization called Music Alive in Cork. And I think it would be great if they expanded into hospitals and so on. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Anyone can benefit. Anyone can benefit, yeah. Some people, Arnold, have said that the, uh, th the sheer fact that this book exists mm. is a kind of... A, a remarkable, a, a astonishing triumph given how unwell mm. you were and some of the things you describe being being homeless, being mm. beaten up in a hospital. At <coughs> one stage, you are urinated upon in the street by, mm. by men in the street. That That is as rock bottom as rock bottom can be. And mm. yet, here is this book and here are you and you have emerged mm. from that hellish place mm. uh, which 
I guess, is enormously inspiring for anyone who is fearful of their own diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Mm. I, I wonder if you would be willing to read another extract that perhaps mm. touches on the, the, the end of your story as you are beginning yeah. to recover. Yeah. Um, well, the final chapter is a uh, 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 summing up uh, of what it's like, it's a reflection on, on, the, on, on, my, on my life in that, in that decade, and it's written, obviously, more recently, so it is about recovery. Um, recovery has not eliminated my character flaws. I can still lose my temper, be irritable, fractious, impatient, intolerant, complaining, pessimistic, bored, petty, and show poor judgment. But what my recovery has meant is that over time, I have felt better in myself and above all, stable in mood. Now I can make plans for the future, confident that they won't be derailed by illness. So it is that weeks, then months, then years go by, and slowly but gradually and definitively the brain, the body, and the mind repair. Feeling excited does not lead to uncontrollable exuberance, euphoria, nor to mania. It is just excitement. Feeling sad does not lead to self-excoriating despair, melancholy, nor to suicidal depression. It is just sadness. My recovery did not happen by itself. Time alone was not enough. It required effort, action, agency, and the help of others. It is only when I stopped waiting passively and took active steps to, to help myself that recovery really took place. The late Michael Paul Gallagher, SJ, my very close friend, uh, Jesuit, Society of Jesuits, left a wonderful legacy of writing and spiritual reflections. In his final book, he wrote, each day has its light and shadows, its pendulum from yes to no. But the no is always weaker, provoked by some lack of energy or vigor.